and join us. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Emre Hatar, uh, working as a lecturer uh, at Recep Tayyip Erdogan University, Turkey. So this is the third day of uh, eight uh, annual conference on Eurasian politics and society. So we are together on the panel that uh, stated as women in European politics. So we know that uh, more women uh, are entering politics in Europe and uh, Central Asia, but uh, political parity remains distance nowadays as well. So it of course will take uh, some uh, a long time probably uh, to close, uh, especially the gender gap in politics or in other areas as well. So especially in Europe and Central Asia regions, uh, women's uh, representation in, uh, especially in parliaments uh, has been raising but still, it is uh, historically uh, low on the low rate. So it is a good topic, I think. So uh, I, I will enjoy this session uh, for sure. So in this panel, uh, we have uh, five uh, papers uh, and of course presentations. So uh, let me first introduce the panelists and their topics. Then uh, we will start with uh, Yasemin Telikol. So firstly, we have uh, Yasemin Telikol from uh, North Northwestern University in Qatar. Her topic is going to be about, here are the women in Turkey, Russia, geopolitics. Then we have Gulnoza Ismailova from the University of World Economy and uh, Diplomacy. Uh, topic is going to be about strengthening the role of women in politics. Uh, as a factor uh, in democratic transformation. Then we will have Sabrina White and Georgina Holmes uh, from the University of Leeds and King's College London. Their topic is going to be about uh, nation branding and gender uh, diplomacy after crisis. France's response to see uh, allegations in uh, Central Asian Republic. Uh, after their presentation, we will have Mohamed Hashiru and Özgür Fekci from Karadeniz uh, Technical University. Uh, and their topic is going to be about uh, women empowerment through political participation in rising power, uh, comparison of Turkey and Ghana. Uh, then the last panelist will be Anna Uzlika Uzlaki uh, from Center of Social Sciences, uh, Cornelius University of Budapest. And her topic is going to be the peculiar normativity of movement. So if uh, Yasemin Çelikol is ready, we can start with her. Uh, the, state, the stage is yours, Yasemin. Thank you, Emre. Before we start, let me uh, explain this as well, sorry. So we have five presentations uh, and 90 minutes. So it will be better to keep your presentation between 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, yes, then uh, we will have the question answer session uh, at the end of the panel. So if anyone has any question, you can put your questions on chat bar or you can raise your hand and ask your question. Uh, okay, so now you can start. Thank you, Emra, and thank you, um, everyone, for being here. Um, and I apologize for not having a PowerPoint. I recently, literally, just actually yesterday, moved into my home in Qatar, so it's been it's been quite a hectic time. But I hope that you will find my presentation useful uh, in some ways. Uh, Gulnoz, I think you're unmuted. You might want to mute because we're hearing you. <laughs> okay, so. Um, as we know, international relations and geopolitics, though from two distinct scholarly traditions, are regularly conflated in scholarship and media. Consistent between the two, though, is an emphasis on official government development. And I think, um, as we can also see from this conference, right, uh, in which men remain <clears throat> the central agents. In response to masculinist international relations, Cynthia Enloe in 1990 asked with her book, where are the women? 
In this paper, I answer Enloe's call to reveal gender discursive practices on which international relations depends and illuminate women's unacknowledged role in global politics and the personal as international through transnational Turkish TV series that are consumed by millions of Russian women. In the last decade, Turkish television series transformed from mostly a local product to a global phenomenon with perplexing popularity even in countries adversarial to Turkey, such as Russia. Following multiple wars through the centuries, Russian and Turkish contemporary relations involved tiptoeing around each other while competing for geopolitical influence. Their geopolitical tango is based on exerting influence, as most of us know in this conference, over the Caucasus says the Balkans, Central Asia, and the Middle East. In tandem, um, as an article in two, after following the, the crisis in 2016 characterized, <clears throat> normalized relations equal to a billion dollar handshake and a commiserative unified partnership in their complex relations with the US and Western Europe. Turkey's newfound geopolitical power in the Middle East, Central Asia, and the Balkans since the disintegration of the USSR, and mostly recently via Turkish TV series, is disconcerting to Russia, particularly because Russian viewers, the vast majority of whom are women, are also awed by Turkish series. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about Turkish TV series um, in Russia, <clears throat> just so you can have some context, um, the first Turkish media to be sold in Russia was the miniseries Lovebird, and that was sold in 1986, followed by Milky Way in 1989, and both were just loved and viewed by millions in the USSR. The third Turkish series really made a boom, though, um, not just in Russia, around the world. It was magnificent century, um, and it was the sensation that spearheaded the vast distribution of Turkish series in Russia. Magnificent century aired in 2012 on channel Domashni, the most popular channel for women in Russia, though in, and not only in Russia, also in Ukraine and Central Asia. <clears throat> Though years passed after the initial broadcast, Magnificent Century remains firmly rooted in Russian public discourse. Gossip articles about the actors' lives, the hidden truth about the women in the harem, um, and tourism destinations that became popular following Magnificent Century are, are some recent examples. Like from, from 2020, um, I, I have, I'm quoting the articles. If you'd like the references to any of what I'm saying, please do ask me. I have them all, but I just did not have time to put it together PowerPoint. Again, apologies. Russian producers and directors continue to express their admiration for Magnificent Century and their wish to emulate its success voice still nearly a decade after the initial broadcast. By 2013, headlines such as Turkey will have its own Hollywood named Turkeywood appeared in Russia, explaining, it, quote, it is worth noting that popular Turkish series are in great demand today, both in Russia and around the world. Two Turkish series, and again, just to illustrate more the, the popularity, the very much unprecedented popularity of Turkish series in Russia, um, Love and Punishment and Forbidden Love were among the most searched on Google and Yandex um, as Valentine's Day entertainment in 2013. By 2014, a quarter of the searched TV series on Yandex were for Turkish dramas, with 80% of searches for Magnificent Century. In 2015, the Russian production company Star Media, capitalizing on the roaring success of the Turkish series, falsely advertised a project, a TV series called East West, um, where Turkey was East and Russia was West, as the first Russo-Turkish drama. The widespread popularity of Turkish TV series was also acknowledged in the Russian parliament when two state Duma deputies recommended banning them following the 2015 jet crisis. Meanwhile, Russian viewers today, also today, continue to enroll in Turkish language classes and travel to Istanbul. 
the Istanbul Masi is Topkapu Palace, Hiram and Suleiman's historic place of residence, and the must buys are Hiram's jewelry replicas. In the true attestation of their fandom, Russian fans of Magnificent Century created a website with nearly 800 pages of facts about the series, history, actors, and videos. Numerous other fans founded Kontakte and Instagram fan groups and created websites with up-to-date information about Turkish TVs and celebrities. Um, Turkish TV series in Russia are broadcast through cable and satellite on Turk TV channels Domashni, Romantichne, Ruski, Bestseller, and as of November 2020, Timeless Dizzy Channel, a satellite channel exclusively dedicated to Turkish TV series. Viewers also watch some watch series of uh, some dubbed by fans on Kontakte and YouTube, in addition to Netflix since 2015, with the perquisite of Russian subtitles as of October 2020. Um, and just to give an example of how, so it could all just be trivial up, uh, up and, uh, to this point, right? I mean, women's entertainment, um, women's love for, say, romance novels were. Uh, generally treated as just trivial, superficial, not really important. Um, but Turkish TV series were really hard to ignore. Just, I mean, I gave some of the examples. Um, but a really poignant example of this is a TV series, Sultan of My Heart, which is a fictional 19th century love story about Ottoman Sultan Mahmud and Russian noble Anna, which was publicized with great fanfare in Russia in late December 2018. What was special about this series? This was indeed the first ever Russo-Turkish co-production. And not only that, it was produced for state-owned Russian Channel One, the first TV channel of the Russian Federation. The co-production was between Russian state-owned media giant Gazprom Media Kit Film Studio and the Turkish Maya Productions, represented globally by Global Connection International Media Group. Um, Sultan of My Heart is the culmination of a number of geopolitical, economic, social, and media developments. Since 2012, following the Magnificent Century sensation and dozens of other subsequently broadcast Turkish TV series in Russia, Turkey is increasingly regarded as a potent global media power in Russia. Also, other than the usual geopolitical hurdles, such as Turkey's support for Crimea and Ukraine and Russo-Turkish friction over Azerbaijan and Syria, there, no, there were no fully fledged geopolitical crisis to preclude such a media partnership. Since the normalization of relations in late 2016, the proximate relations between Russia and Turkey are celebrated in, in, this, in the way such as this, with, with an expansion of collaboration, including this TV series, which is a safe investment according to the stellar ratings of Turkish TV series within the last decade. Alexander Bondarev, director of production at the Russian Kit Film Studio, hoped that Russian viewers would fall in love with Sultan of My Heart as they had with Magnificent Century. While Janik uh, Faiziev, the general director of the Russian partner Kit Film Studio, reminisced about the goals of the production as follows. And I quote, our partners have rebuilt, the Turkish partners, have rebuilt a huge city, prepared costumes and props of the highest level. And the fact that we managed to get such a big American star, the, the director, for the project as the director of the first two episodes gives us hope that we'll make it to, we'll make the product international class. The choice of Turkish actors for the main male roles was very difficult because we really wanted to bounce the image of Russian viewers and especially female viewers about Oriental beauty with the beauty standards of Turkey and in the East. A critical element in painstaking process was the casting of the male Turkish actors and, and the quote ended there, of course, that were to be in cadence with the especially female viewers expectations about Oriental beauty. Further, producers sought to balance these viewer expectations with the purported beauty standards of Turkey and the East. For the Russian producers, it was also very important for us that the main female role in the series would be played by a Russian actress. 
The main female role is played by Russians in a number of historical and fictional romances between Russian beauties and Turkish Ottoman charmers, including Catherine the Great and Baltaj and Mehmet Pasha, uh, Roxelana and Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, Anastasia and Sultan Ahmed Khan, who was um, in this Magnificent Century Kosam sequel, um, Alexander and Kurtzit, Tatiana and Kemal, who were in the uh, Russian TV series East West, and in this most recent TV series, Anna and Sultan Mahmoud. Along with these, there are many more undocumented instances of love and marriage between Russian women and Turkish men, as um, a, a book by Block uh, shows us in 2017. A, 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 nice, a very nice ethnographic study, actually, um, about Russian women migrating to Turkey and so on. Um, these historical precedents and contemporary romantic entanglements developed in tandem with centuries of turbulent geopolitical relations between Russia and Turkey, making the enthusiastic reception of Turkish TV series in, in Russia particularly puzzling. Russia must contend with the Turkish TV series because women demand them. By demanding and consuming the series, women challenge the foundational level of politics in their countries by problematizing the national discourse of Turkey as the other. Millions of Russian women choose to watch Turkish TV series for their relatability and high production quality, unsettling the nation's building narratives that had circulated and prevailed until then, transforming the dehumanized other of their countries into a relatable human being. By watching Turkish TV series in their unassuming everyday lives, women inspired a host of Orientalist Russian productions, such as East West, and there's also um, Oriental Wives, another one that was inspired by the popularity of the Turkish TV series. The Turkish series exhibited how publicly... Oh, uh, I guess someone is unmuted. Apologies. Um, yes. And I'm almost done. Uh, by watching Turkish TV series in their unassuming everyday lives, women inspired a host of Orientalist productions, as I said, um, and they exhibited how women's voices from their home, from their everyday lives, uh, can disrupt hegemonic geopolitical discourses, which is sought to be sustained in the Russian productions. Uh, the public discourse and media reactions to Turkish series in Russia underscored the relationship of, of human agency to transnational popular culture and how in turn transnational popular culture influences international relations. Following the broadcast of Turkish series, Russian bookstores filled with Turkish literature, buses and airplanes filled with Istanbul bound tourists and the constructed image of Turkey as backward and barbaric was shattered. The Turkish TV series give prominence to the private as the global and in line with Enlo's work, show how women act as political agents in their everyday lives, even when not sufficiently represented in official government, like in Russia, like Emrah told us uh, in the beginning of this panel, where women are largely absent in official government business and lack sufficient representation. Also, according to a World Economic Forum report from 2020, by answering Enlo's call to ask, where are the women in international relations? Turkish series are exemplary global media that eliminates women's political presence uh, is my main argument. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yasemin. Uh, that was such a great presentation, but to be honest, uh, with some PowerPoints, it will be much, much interesting. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for uh, being on time as well. Uh, so we are going to continue with uh, uh, uh Ismailova. Uh, her talk is going to be strengthening the role of women uh, in politics as a factor in democratic transformation. So if you are ready, Ulnoza, you can uh, start from now. Yes, we can hear you.
my topic will be um, today about the women in power of policy in Uzbekistan. I wanted to say cheers to uh, all the election gentlemen. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for hosting me today at the conference and it's a pleasure and honor. And um, before the beginning, I want to say a couple of words about my university, which I represent, the University of World Economy and Diplomacy, which is located in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, in the heart of Central Asia. So it is the uh, very uh, important point to gender issues um, for today for Uzbekistan for the whole Central Asia also. So um, if we talk about the uh, state policy of women empowerment in Uzbekistan, uh, the economic, the social, political uh, reforms carried out in Uzbekistan in the field of state building and uh, public administration and uh, has also covered the empowerment of female, creating the conditions for them to reveal their potential knowledge and talent. The current reforms in Uzbekistan that have been paying special emphasis on strengthening the political activity of women. If we'll see the last uh, rating of the woman of the uh, gender equality achieved in a top 10 countries, they have achieved the UN Women General Equality. They announced that there are none countries that achieve the full gender equality. So today, uh, the aim of my report, of my speech will be uh, aimed to, to investigate on what extent the government policy to empower women. Uh, you know the story. Uh, your voice is not clear, so it may be, be better to not use your headphone, maybe, or... It's not clear? Now, now it sounds clear. Can you talk now? I will try to uh, speak louder. Yes, that's, that's okay. perfect. That's, that's much better, yeah. Thank you. Ah, okay, thank you, sorry. So uh, the aim of my report today is to investigate um, what to extend the government policy to empower the woman that has been successful, what kind of achievements and the problems have been revealed on this fact. In order to reach meet this goal, I will analyze first how the system of public support for women empowerment has been transformed during these last 30 years in independent Uzbekistan, and second, how women's representation and leadership position of the public administration has been advanced, and what kind of real effect uh, these have had on, on a better representation of women interests. And third, uh, the comparative analysis of the provision of women rights, freedom in 19th and for today. And so if we talk about the um, current Uzbekistan situation, so if you know Uzbekistan, it's going through a period of unique transformation and renewal in the development of the state and society, and particular advances in girls' education, women's economic empowerment, and political participation. An active reform effort aimed at abolishing discriminatory laws. The gender policy has been raised to a level of the state policy and becomes one of the priority forces of countries. So Uzbekistan adopted development action strategy for five years, 2017-2021, that opened a new opportunities for raising the level of education, economic activeness of women, attracting them to the entrepreneurial activities, strengthening the role of women in governments, and further strengthening the foundation of the family. In particular, increasing the social political activity of women strengthening their role in management of the state and society is enshrined uh, in it as one priority task facing the state. So, uh, based on the global sustainable development goals, the national goals and targets for sustainable development for the period up to 2030 were approved, which also includes the goal five, achieve gender equality and empower of all women and girls. Yeah, in Uzbekistan. So the last five years has become break 
grew in the field of human rights and her was especially noticeable in the field of gender policy. So we will uh, follow these main achievements in this area I can uh, talk about the several normative, firstly, several normative legal acts that has been adopted uh, that created a qualitatively new legal basis for ensuring gender equality promoting women. Only over the past, uh, past five years, about 30 normative legal acts have been adopted regarding the empowerment of the position of women and society and the promotion in all areas. Among the most important regular, uh, regulatory legal acts are the laws of Uzbekistan on equal rights and equal opportunities for women and men, and second, on protection of women from harassment and violence. You know, previously we cannot talk about this uh, domestic violence and harassment openly. It was like a um, prohibited uh, sphere to talk about. But today I can see just from newspapers that uh, the protection order was given to the woman, more than 35,000 women was to take their protection orders. So that is great that we can talk about it. It's uh, all because of the new legal acts. So adoption of these uh, laws has been discussed over the 15 years. It was like a silence in the system. And uh, the second uh, measures have been taken to improve the institutional framework for ensuring gender equality. So now the Senate, Senate Committee on Gender Issue, Parliamentary Commission on Ensuring Gender Equality, Rehabilitation centers for women victims of violence. We have shelters and women's internship centers have been created. Third, the, the range of gender issues for discussion has been significantly, significantly expanded. The agenda for discussing gender policy includes include issues of domestic violence, protection of vulnerable categories of women, increasing the representation of women not only in the parliament, but also in the other state Sorry, Sorry is someone unmute or uh, there is another voice coming behind? Can you hear me? Uh, I can hear, but someone, is, someone else is talking as well. I think it's coming behind your scene. Is someone mm -hmm. talking in your office or? I will ask. Largis? Yeah, I think someone is talking on the phone, yeah. Um, may I continue? Yeah, of course, but your, your voice is not coming clear. That's why I interrupt you. Give me a second, please. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. All right, no worries. So, uh, so the third measures have been taken to conduct effective monitoring of gender policy. In particular, the website gender.state.us has been created, and it's great because now we can see uh, these uh, statistics are kept in this uh, website. So the quantitative and the qualitative indicators that have been developed to assess the effectiveness of measures taken. And uh, next, measures have been taken to expand the international cooperations on the issue of ensuring women's rights and gender equality. Uzbekistan is not only actively participating in international forums on women's rights, but also initiates their holding. For example, a regional business forum for women entrepreneurs in Central Asia was held. And of course, special attention is paid to awareness raising campaign. It was uh, held annually 16 days against violence. Round tables have been uh, become a regular pr practice, publication, videos are published and reach is being actively carried out. 
So all these measures are taken based on the recommendation of international human rights bodies, uh, taking into account the best practices, national characteristics, the assistance of international partners, and the active participation of all departments, civil society institutions, and academia. So uh, concerning the race of the uh, woman empowerment and the uh, uh, representation of women at the parliament, we can say that we did a great job in this. So uh, we had the uh, election in 2019, parliamentary election, and we can see the increase of women representation in national parliament. So now more than a quarter, 25 and five points, uh, the representation of women in international MPs. So uh, according to the results of the parliamentary elections, uh, they counted 32% of deputies of the legislative chamber of all energies and 25% in Senate. So now Uzbekistan entered the top 50 countries. The country ranks 37th place and it is ahead almost of all four Soviet countries. This testifies the fundamental and new approach and trends in the organizing the activities of the Uzbek parliament. We can see the other percentage of women representation. The share of women in political parties has reached 45%. In higher education, more than 40%. In internship, 35%. And in the World Bank's Women Business and Law Index, Uzbekistan in 2020 was included into the list of 27 countries that implemented significant reforms in the field of women's rights and gender equality, rose five positions and took uh, 134 place out of 190. So uh, if we uh, see uh, the last year, uh, the COVID-19 has negatively affected sectors where the share of women employment is high, also in Uzbekistan too. So the COVID-19 uh, turned out to be a global problem for all mankind not only in Uzbekistan, but beyond. The pandemic is the most severe crisis in the history of Uzbekistan since independence. So dramatic declines in empowerment, well-being, incomes made the authority take urgent steps. In most cases, women's housework increased, especially in urban areas. The most negative economic and social consequences of COVID-19 were experienced by poor families, large families, migrants, and young people aged 19 to 30. Uh, the number of families with reduced incomes has increased. The resolution of the President of the Republic of Uzbekistan on measures to support women and further improve the system of ensuring their active participation in the public provides the implementation of a system their active participation in the public life, which provides the implementation of a system of comprehensive social support and protection, targeted assistance from the state to women whose social situation and living conditions are difficult, unemployed and social inactive to bring the work on the systematic, systematic study, analysis and solution of women's problem, needs and interests to qualitatively new level. So uh, if we will emphasize the one a new adoption of the Uzbekistan is with the normative legal documents, the establishing coordination of the results oriented acti activities of agencies and managers responsible for the formation of women's book. So what is the women's book? It is a database for identifying, eliminating and controlling the problems of unemployed women who need social, economic, legal, psychological support, knowledge, and professional training. So uh, it is targeted to work with the woman included in it and the identification and solution of their problem with the difficult social conditions and living conditions. The government also proceeded to work to improve women's economic status by allowing special credit access to female employers and businesses that employ women. If we talk about what we are going to do further to advance and protect the rights and interests of women, of course, in modern life, gender issue and the struggle for women's equality are the subject of active discussion, not only by scientists, but also in society as a whole. 
moving towards gender equality is not a technocratic goal, it's a political process. So it requires a new way of thinking in which the stereotyping of women and men gives way to a new philosophy that regards all people, irrespective of gender, as essential subjects of change. The existing legal framework aimed at protecting women from discrimination in all areas of personal and public life will only be effective if changes in economic, political, and cultural life are put into practice. It is then that such positive changes can lead to radical social renewal, but still there is much work to do in this process. So uh, the uh, one point I want to uh, draw your attention is also we should take into account global trends and it is important to pay special attention to strengthen the institutional framework for protecting the rights of women of vulnerable categories of women and important emphasize in the development of international cooperation in Uzbekistan in the field of ensuring women's rights should be placed on vulnerable categories of women. It is necessary to study more deeply the international standards, the mechanism being developed in this direction at present to take measures, measures to raise awareness on these issues, to put forward Uzbekistan initiatives in this regard. It is recommended to develop projects to protect vulnerable categories of women, for example, with UNICEF to protect the rights and employ and empowering girls, with IOMI uh, in protecting of migrant women, with UNODC on the protecting of women in prison, with ILO uh, on women's rights in rural areas, and with UNESCO on women's representation in higher education and science. So thank you very much, and I will be uh, glad to answer your questions on the regard of women issues, gender, power, equality, empowerment in Uzbekistan. Thank you and welcome to our university in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Gurnoza. Thank you for a timely presentation. Uh, that was such a great presentation uh, from Uzbekistan side. So we will continue with uh, Sabrina White and Georgina Olmos. Uh, they are going to discuss Topic on nation, friend, and gender diplomacy after crisis. So, if they are ready, we will start their presentation. Yes, we can see your PowerPoint as well, so you can continue. You can Great. start. Can you hear me all right? Yes, your voice is clear. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much, uh, and thank you to the other presenters as well. Really interesting presentations. Um, so. This paper, Georgina unfortunately can't be here today, um, but this paper we're looking at kind of a, a big amalgamation of, of concepts and theories um, in response to a case study. Um, so I kind of want to start a little bit with, with rewinding back to 2015 the, that uh, perhaps you're aware that there was a scandal that hit international uh, headlines that French Sengaris peacekeeping troops uh, were involved in allegations of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse of boys, uh, young boys aged between about seven and 11 years old in the Central African Republic. Um, this, uh, this case was then covered up uh, by the mission, uh, MINUSCA. It was covered up by the UN at a very high level, and it led uh, ultimately to the resignation of Anders Kompis, uh, who was the UN official who eventually broke the story. And, uh, and what we found out basically is that uh, the political implications of having a permanent five Security Council member uh, involved in these allegations led to the idea at the United Nations that somehow uh, it, it wasn't it was it was worth keeping under wraps. Um, but of course, for France, uh, this had huge implications at home. And so this paper began with sort of a curiosity um, of what has happened um, uh, in France, uh, both internally and externally leading up to the adoption of its uh, feminist diplomacy and uh, a feminist foreign policy in 2018. And so we're sort of weaving in together um, three bodies uh, of scholarship uh, on feminist foreign policy, uh, which states are increasingly adopting. Um, uh, for instance, uh, Mexico, uh, uh, Sweden, uh, and, and now France. We're also interested in uh, uh, gendered and feminist diplomacy, 
um, and in a phenomenon of nation branding, um, which I'll explain in a little bit more detail. Um, so in terms of how, what are we drawing from? Uh, we're looking at sort of the idea of ontological insecurity in modern statecraft. So uh, what is the political image uh, of the contemporary liberal state, of the manly liberal state? Um, and so there are many others who have spoken about how, written about how contemporary statecraft is gendered in ways that silence and marginalize gendered and raced others. Uh, that the patriarchal state um, is built on sort of, sort of a normative heterosexual manly conception of sovereignty, um, which is threatened by, in, by the anxiety of the fear of feminization and emasculation. And so this is sort of, for instance, if we think about protection discourses uh, of uh, uh, states being dominating others, um, being powerful and, uh, uh, and you know, uh, responding uh, where those sort of narratives are challenged. Uh, and uh, Bierstecker and Weaver, for instance, have written about how the modern state's liberal political image is in perpetual risk of living up to its sort of interpreted social and political values as renormative uh, masculinist values. And if we look also to the body of literature on feminist foreign policy and gender diplomacy, um, uh, there are many who've written about how pro-feminist work alters foreign policy, actually, of liberal states, that it's something that's quite good. Um, and then uh, Goetz, for instance, says that actually feminist foreign policies are manipulated uh, by modern liberal states to, to serve um, their own political agenda, so sort of a co-option of feminist foreign policy. And so increasingly, there are questions around evaluating the goodness of if a state says that they're going to be feminist or that they're promoting gender equality and empowerment of women, uh, uh, the scholarship is telling us to look a little bit deeper and to ask questions about, you know, maybe where these kind of assertions come from and what it is that they actually mean in practice. Um, so then the other sort of anchor of what we're looking at uh, is nation branding. Um, so more or less in the last 20 or so odd years, um, countries have hired PR firms uh, to rebrand themselves to make themselves seem more attractive to the outside world. Um, and it's considered to be a, a long-term strategic approach to reputation management that promotes a grand narrative of the state. So it, it's a specific articulation of the way that a state wants to be seen. Um, and there are certain positioning platforms that states will use to sort of articulate this nation brand. So for instance, liberty, equality, fraternity um, is sort of the French positioning platform, a slogan that sort of has a representative, you know, French um, historical ideas, cultural ideas, political ideas about how it wants to be seen in the world. And so it's a brand oriented competitive political identity and also a form of soft power that's bound in gendered, raced and queer logics. Um, it's also something that's used to promote, for instance, uh, engagement in niche building as a component of promoting uh, nation brands. Um, but we're ultimately looking at uh, a nation brand as something that's crafting uh, recognition and legitimating uh, practices to project this de desired self-image um, and to reconcile contradictions that might be inherent in, in, in a state's geopolitical power. For instance, France is a former colonial and imperial power where uh, it's attempting to be seen as good, uh, a force for good in the world, but of course the colonial legacy uh, is uh, you know, full of violence that France has concealed. Uh, a nation brand also entail entails quite a lot of anxious labor. It's quite vulnerable to public uh, opinion and nation brand ambassadors are pretty key for performing the nation brand and accruing political legitimacy and recognition. So we started with two research questions um, uh, to weave together these bodies of scholarship is how do contemporary liberal states engage in anxious labor of nation branding, feminist foreign policy and diplomatic practices during and after a political crisis? And how do the co-constitutive legitimizing and recognition practices of, of state branding interact over time? And so we use the case study of France uh, based on this, uh, the Sangaris allegations um, and uh, we chose France, not only, not only because it was involved in the allegations and then, you know, a couple of years later announced a, a feminist foreign policy, but it's also a middle power with a, a, and a former colonial power with a well-established nation brand. Um, so it has uh, uh, you know, strong recognitions as a military power and a moral authority, a permanent seat on the Security Council, um, very clear positioning platform, uh, engages in niche diplomacy, for instance, in the United Nations peacekeeping, and sort of perpetually uh, advances the savior narrative um, that historically conceals violence 
um, in response to internal and external instability. So sort of the liminal state that, uh, for instance, France is a continual uh, renegotiation of, of the history of colonialism in Algeria uh, has had uh, threats uh, at home and abroad. And this narrative is rewritten uh, pretty much by every president um, uh, since uh, de Gaulle. Um, so our methodology is that we use post-colonial queer approach, um, uh, looking at gendered, race, and sexual logics. Um, and we conduct a discourse analysis of 153 statements made by 26 French officials uh, between uh, 2011 and 2020. Uh, so, our, in our methodology, we're drawing on an idea of a political crisis life, scales, uh, life cycle. So, in nation branding scholarship, there's actually been quite a lot of work on what happens in the post-crisis after a crisis has happened. But we want to look in more detail to sort of try to capture what's happening along um, all of the crisis lines. So, establishing what is the nation brand and discursive responses on similar areas, for instance, around sexual violence or sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, prior to the crisis, um, how do we define what the crisis is actually, and when does the crisis end, and what actually happens afterwards? Um, and so we look at United Nations Security Council um, speeches made by French ambassadors, as well as uh, public press releases from the Elysee, and uh, 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 French press uh, interviews with, with government officials. Uh, so in order to establish what France was speaking about in relation to sexual exploitation, abuse and peacekeeping and sexual violence prior to the crisis that began in uh, the 29th of April 2015, uh, we found that generally France was quite stable, right? Uh, it was bureaucratic and relatively unemotive. Um, uh, traditional niche building tactics uh, presented an ethical and sincere brand, sincere brand France. Um, France continues to position itself as a moral authority uh, continually uh, on uh, ending sexual violence and conflict that France was sort of a leader actually in trying to promote this, uh, uh, this narrative, um, which was ultimately quite militaristic of combating and fighting the scourge of, of sexual violence. Uh, and Francois de Latte, who's the permanent representative to France on the Security Council, presents himself as a brand ambassador, as a feminist changed agent of the global north who opposes uh, black and brown bad men and bad states of the global south who are framed as responsible for women's oppression. But on the 29th of April, the news, British newspaper The Guardian releases the, the scandal of this story, and France immediately engages in anxious labor uh, of trying to to manage its sort of its nation brand. So brand ambassadors take on an effective state, um, the incredibly emotive language um, uh, presenting shock, but eventually these uh, brand ambassadors start to create sharp boundaries between themselves and the accused uh, who become sort of the, the othered, uh, uh, drawing stark boundaries between what is, what is France and what is not France. And so France is able to distance itself from these perpetrators and from these abuses also by leveraging attention to conflict related sexual violence and perpetuating that it was, you know, these were an exception, they aren't really French, um, but look at all of these bad black and brown men who are in the global south, those are the real perpetrators. And so we see quite an increase then on this discourse of, of conflict related sexual violence is the real sexual violence. Um, and so they mobilize sort of a moral outrage of othering uh, to transition France uh, through the political crisis life cycle, um, eventually stabilizing uh, this boundary setting uh, that catapults it into a post-crisis recovery phase. So by September 2016, uh, France is able to reclaim the narrative in a very clear speech at the United Nations General Assembly. They no longer mention uh, the sexual exploitation and abuse crisis and the Sangara soldiers uh, from this point forward. Uh, and then, of course, in 2017, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron is elected. This happens around the same time that we have the, the Me Too movement globally. France's version was Balance Sans Pork. Um, but also happening in the background is France is dealing with terrorist threats, with the attacks in Paris on the Bataclan, um, that this sort of dual narratives of, of securitization against terrorism and, and calls for gender equality sort of morph then into to create a, a to creating sort of a security state attempting to uh, reinforce its protection narratives internally as well as, as uh, domestically as well as internationally. And so in 2018, sort of as a niche building tactic, France announces a feminist foreign policy and appoints a gender diplomat of Marlene Schiappa, uh, who uh, presents duly uh, with the former Ministry of Defense. And so we see always a combination between feminist foreign policy and the defense ministry. And so our key arguments are 
Um, but when performing as nation brand ambassadors, French diplomats mobilize France's nation brand to progress through uh, its crisis life cycle as quickly as possible to limit reputational damage. Um, but feminist foreign policy and feminist diplomacy serve as short term solutions to reputational damage after political crisis to sort of rebuild the image of the state. Um, but actually, the longer term slower project of France's nation brand follows a masculine white supremacist neoliberal logic and stabilizes the grand narrative of the middle power and its projected image as a legitimate strategic leader in global governance. Um, the really important point here is that in the post crisis phase, uh, there are, there's not really a difference in how what France is doing internationally on sexual violence or sexual exploitation and abuse. They just speak about it more frequently, okay? But it's the exact same kind of narratives that were presented from 2011 to 2015 uh, that's just been rebranded, okay? There's a new face that's put on it, but actually very little has changed beyond it. Um, and so we sort of argue then as areas for further research um, that, oh, actually I've gone completely over time, haven't I? Shall I just stop here and leave it on the stage um, and say thank you very much. Oh, you can't continue, don't worry. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. So we say that nation branding uh, then is constitutive of gendered and racialized power logics that are linked to actually larger global structure, structural inequalities. That we should look at nation branding as something that's actually um, reproducing um, uh, patriarchy and hierarchy in the international state system, it's sort of the marketization of states and, and, and global political economies. So the centering of a nation branding then helps situate uh, feminist foreign policy production and feminist uh, diplomacy in, in relation to sort of longer term processes of states gendered narratives. So it has a usefulness and understanding um, a state sort of projected um, uh, uh, what its longer term processes of projecting its, its nation brand are. Um, brand ambassadors as gender diplomats perform the nation brand, um, drawing on it strategically to progress through crisis life cycles and, and, and limit reputational damage. And that's sort of their primary role then in managing the nation brand. And that gendered and queer analysis of nation branding are required to gain a better understanding of how modern liberal states construct their political image and build legitimacy in the international system, especially why they choose to choose certain um, niche areas um, uh, uh, to, to accrue soft power. Um, and, and it's also important to, to look at to understand how states manage everyday ontological insecurity and political crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. That was such a great presentation from Western side. So we go east and west, different cases. That's okay. really interesting, really good. Uh, we will have questions at the end of the session. Uh, so if you have any question to all of our presenters, please uh, go ahead and write on the chat box or you can raise your hand. I think we have one question from Fahit, but it will be better to ask at the end if it's okay with you, uh, Fahit Hassan. So we will continue with uh, Mohammed Hashir and Özgür Tekci from Karadeniz Technical University. So they are going to give a presentation on women empowerment through political participation in rising powers, a comparison of Turkey and Ghana, so east, west. Now we are going to South Africa. So the stage is yours, Mohamed. If you are ready, you can start your presentation. So we cannot, yes, go ahead. All right, so thank you very much. And um, let me mention the fact that I've been a bit busy and I, I was supposed to log in, but I'm a bit late, so I'm very sorry for that. So, um, yeah. So without much ado, I wanna say, I wanna start my presentation and uh, actually bulk of it would be a kind of um, an explanatory thing instead of showing you some kind of slides. So um, this our topic, and um, women empowerment through political participation in Russia and West Africa, actually, and the case of Turkey, Nigeria, and Ghana. So, um, so for an introduction, we might want to go through this um, point that are very important. So the first point is that um, feminists have always argued that the world had, has had enough of men dominated in much, uh, in every 
sphere of life, like including politics. And you can see that, and it's very obvious that that's what is happening now. So um, this is a search done by um, Randall, and he concludes that um, activities of women and their achievement in leadership, leadership positions, has made um, women's representation of political participation a topic for discussion. So there are so many reservations, there are so many research done about women participation and how they can contribute in the political arena also. But look at this point that is very important done by Ajubeje. Ajubeje says that the marginalization of women in spheres of politics is as a result of this limited conception of the relevance of women in politics. So as we can see that in our um, uh, next slide, we would see clearly that in some countries like Nigeria, um, so many women have that kind of reservation of being in politics because of that kind of perception that it comes with it. So quickly, let me take you through um, this point. So the goal of this paper, which is under construction, is that is to look at the women empowerment of capacities through political participation in Turkey, Nigeria, and Ghana. So if you look at it, you find out clearly that our aim is to contribute to the theoretical literature of comparative regional studies, a new determining factor, and that is strengthening democracy through women's political participation. Um, there is this kind of um, uh, reservation or this kind of um, belief uh, in academia that when women contribute in politics, uh, it is going to strengthen democracy because democracy gives people the platform to contribute equally and gender must not be a problem. So since um, a gender, that is the female gender is being um, sidelined and when they are given the chance to contribute, we might see that kind of um, even distribution of representation and that goes way to strengthen democracy. So, so without much ado, let's move to our next slide. And that is the women empowerment through uh, political participation in Turkey. Of course, the founder of the country, that is Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, made an emphasis. And um, he said that if a society does not wage a common struggle to attain a common goal with its women and men scientifically, there is no way for it to get civilized. So of course, when women do not get even positions as men, um, then that aspect of civilization is something that we are going to miss. And that's the reservation of the founder of the country. And it's very, very important. So in 1938, what happened? The right to vote and be elected was given to women in Turkey. And this came at a time when so many countries in Europe had not even dreamed of giving women the chance to vote. And that's, every, that's what everyone knows, and very, very important. So this breakthrough in Turkey, of course, though a breakthrough, there is a wide gap. So that's a gap we are trying to fill now, that though there is a breakthrough, women in, in, in Turkey have had chances to vote, but that isn't enough. We are not talking about ballot or um, electoral democracy. We are talking about democracy through representation, not the democracy of allowing people to choose their leader. It is a democracy that will allow women to also be selected. You understand? So if you look at this one, that a research by at Ayata and Tutsunjo um, find that the last decade feminist movement have played a critical role that there is this kind of female or feminist movement in Turkey that have played much role in pushing the agenda of women being represented in the political arena. So going forward, um, if you look into the 2017 GGGR, um, that is the Global Gender Gap Report, um, Turkey has been put on 131st on the list of 144 countries and eighth among the 17 Middle East and North African states. So if you look at it holistically, Turkey has not, great, have not gotten a lot of um, strike, 
Um, but then if you look at it in the lens of Middle East and North Africa, it means Turkey has achieved something. So among the G20 also, Turkey falls behind France, Germany, United Kingdom, and Canada, of course. These are democracies that are very old, and of course, we expect them to be ahead of Turkey. So PVR research has lamented that scanty number of women in the game um, is what we find in Turkey, that there are very little um, percentage of women in politics in Turkey. So in local election, that is, you look at the local election in 2014, um, the following distribution was recorded, and that's um, in the metropolitan municipal mayors, municipal councillors, village head positions. Three out of 30 elected metropolitan municipality mayors, 37 out of 1,366 municipality mayors. That is, out of 1,366 municipal mayors, 37 of them are women. And 2,198 out of 20,498 um, municipal council councillors happen to be women, which is very, very little. That is somewhere uh, around 10% or below. So, and 58 out of 18,000 heads of village positions were held by women. And so let's go to the next one. So many studies um, have tried to outline some reasons for women in the shadow of men. So data from 2014 revealed that 30% represent the participation of women in the workforce. The main reason for the loan percentage is household chores. Actually, this is very, very real. And um, in this part of um, the world, what happens is that women still think that it is their primary role to keep the house, to wash, to cook, to do other things. And um, this is very, it is keeping them from away from doing other things. So if a woman had to go to work and come back home and do this, when will she have the time to look for political positions? When will she have the, uh, the, the opportunity or the, 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 the mindset of even joining politics, which is more tiring and uh, has a lot of work to do? And that's it in Turkey. But then this research was done in 2014. So factors preventing women from active politics are low education levels in the rural areas. Of course, the education level of women is getting higher and higher by the, uh, by the day in Turkey. But then in rural areas, like in, in, in the remote areas, what happened is that um, so many women are not educated and they just prefer to go into work without much education. And we know that to join politics, you need some kind of level of education. So traditional patriarchal family relations, of course, we come, most Turkish family believe that the man is the head of the family and that includes leaving him to do all leading roles. So a woman might not feel comfortable having a man um, that who would look at her joint politics, where she could be a community leader or a member of parliament. And one of the reasons is also excessive political pressure of fathers. So um, fathers, husbands, brothers, they have this excessive pressure that they go through and women would not want to join to also go through that kind of stress. And most importantly, financial constraints. It's very expensive to do politics in Turkey. And um, women are not that empowered enough, that is financially empowered, to join politics or to facilitate um, their campaign and representation in politics. And that's a very good um, reason why they are not joining it. So inadequate political parties party policies for women. Of course, most political parties go through the MHP, the AKP, and all those political parties. You find out that they have very limited policies for women. Like they have not given a gap of, they have not given that kind of advantage to women who would want to join politics. Like the rule is always the same for men who have all, already been in the game for a very long time. So and to encourage people or women to join politics, we might, of course, need a political parties to kind, to kind of bring policies that will encourage women to join it. So without this, women are not 
going to join in this part of the world. So the unwillingness to nominate uh, to nominate a female candidate for the Turkish election means that uh, this person, Tansu, which remained the only female to hold a prime, prime minister position in Turkey. But the narrative is changing um, with that activities of the, I don't know how to call it, but then I think the, the good party, the E party, that party is being headed by a female and her advent and the force she's putting in Turkish policy, politics is also changing the face of politics in the country. And it's also giving some kind of hope to women uh, that they could lead in this part of the world. Okay. So um, without much reading, I would want to summarize something very important here. Um, women in this part of the world are not having strategical positions. The first problem we talked about is the fact that there are not enough policies that could um, make entice them or encourage them to join politics. But then political positions, that is party, at the party levels, like the local party levels, local party officers, do not even make that kind of provision for women to lead. So when you have maybe a constituent uh, position, a woman should head it, where she could also organize women uh, alike to join. But then that case is not what we are seeing here. So. Um, women appear to prioritize their party identity instead of their female identity. So to push forward the agenda of a party might be the aim of a woman, not her identity as a woman. The party identity is what is very important to women in this part of the world, as has been researched. But Alkan says something very important, that there are three main factors underlining the inadequate participation of women in Turkish politics. And that is um, our existence of figurativeness in the politics, the exclusion of local from its field of interest and until recently, and the gross limitation of social mobility of women at the local community level. So that is the three things observed by Alkan as the main reason why women are not actively joining politics. But going forward, going forward, um, we have to recognize the fact that Turkey is building, Turkey is growing, therefore uh, many reforms are in place, the, the Ministry of Gender and the other ministries, I think, are making some kind of changes uh, which are very objective in making sure that women join um, um, leading roles in the country. Like politically, some of these um, leaders might not be in the forefront of political uh, leadership, but then in schools, in universities, you see women being the head of department, being head of um, decision making in so many places. So that could be a kind of a game changer or something that is worth um, looking at. But going through the point, um, the Nigerian system or the Nigerian, point, we can see that Nigeria is not very similar to Turkey in this regard because many women have joined Nigerian politics. The population of Nigeria is almost 300 million as compared to 81 million population of Turkey. But then there is this kind of African culture that is not present in Turkey, that men are violent and therefore politics is men for men that are willing to fight wrestle down with their fellow men. Initially, that is not the narrative in the country. Before colonization, the Nigerian case has been that women were together with their men counterpart, like in everything. So a professor that did the research said that before, before colonization, um, women were doing the same thing with their men. So before colonization, we had women leaders women that have, that, have forced, that, have, that have fought wars and they are leading their communities. So the advent of colonization changed everything. The narrative changed because um, a document I read somewhere um, indicated that, that when the colonial master came, he was surprised that women were doing the same things as their men in every sphere of life. So there was a meeting in which men were supposed to be present, but some of these men that are leaders brought in their wives. 
to join the round table, that the decision table. So the white man, or let's say the colonial master was there very surprised. But then Europe was still struggling to bring women to the forefront. So women were relegated to the kitchen and any other thing that is domestic. But then in, the, in Nigeria and other part of the Africa, men were doing the same thing with their women. So the, the colonial master encouraged them to behave like, like, the, 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 like them by putting women home and coming to join. So the narrative change. Sir Mohammed, can you please come up to from some of the tech conversation? Uh, your time is almost over. Okay, okay, no problem. All right, so the situation is that, so the, the, the colonial master changed the narrative and when colonization had stopped, the white person, or let's say the, the colonial master changed his position about women and now, the Nigerians are going to learn everything from the beginning again. So what happens in the part of uh, in Nigeria is that um, the president, uh, the current president, Muhammad Buhari, made a remark that's very, very, uh, very bad, like it's tainted the, the image of women's struggle in the country very bad, when his own wife came out to, to, to criticize him for publicly. What did he say? He said that his woman, uh, his wife, maybe belonged to a different political party. For his wife to criticize him, he's very surprised, but he knows that her position is in the kitchen and in the bedroom, which is very, very untoward towards the struggle for um, um, democracy and women representation in the part of the world. All right, so uh, that with that one said, I have a lot of things to say, but then my duty time constraint, I would want to end here. The part of Ghana, it's, um, it's under construction, but I would want to mention that the situation is not very different from Ghana. That is, Ghana and Nigeria shared so many things together, and they have the same culture, they have the same mindset when it comes to women representation, just that we have some figures to show some kind of discrepancy in the development of these two countries. So without much ado, I would want to end here, and um, I, would expect in, I would be expecting questions from the audience who find um, uh, some portion of it a bit problematic or they would want to add something or ask something for elucidation. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mohamed, uh, yeah. for the presentation again. So we will continue with Anna Uzlaki. So she will talk about the peculiar normativity of movements. So uh, stage is your Anna. Let's start with thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? No? Yes. yes. Oh, thank you. So I just uh, share my screen. Um, yeah. So I'm I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here, and I think the presentations uh, in this section were so interesting. Uh, what I will do here today is a little bit different. So I will. Um, my presentation will be more theoretical uh, than the previous ones. Uh, and, and what I will do is, is what I call a feminist uh, approach to politics, exclusion, and movement. Uh, I, I would like to introduce two arguments which are interconnected. First, I would like to show that exclusion proves to be a fundamental characteristic of the political sphere, which makes the political realm special in the sense that exclusion provides politics with an own special peculiar normativity. This is connected to the idea that if we are to understand how our political sphere of operates, we should start our in investigation from the dynamics of exclusion to which feminists, uh, among a few others, has long raised attention. Secondly, I would like to argue that because exclusion is still a too broad conception, we should focus on the exclusion inherent, which is inherent in movement in order to understand better the very operation of the political realm uh, and the nature and role of exclusion in it. So first, 
I will sketch why the political realm has a special nature. Um, then I outlined three main characteristics which make exclusion inherently political in my argument. And finally, I narrow down this argument to human movement. The initial idea of my research is connected to a political realist recognition about that there is something very specific to the political sphere. A fundamental criticism of contemporary uh, realist political theory against mainstream liberal political theory is that the latter does not recognize uh, the special nature of the subject of its inquiry. So realists challenge mainstream political philosophers for being political moralists and doing applied ethics, since they tend to apply moral norms to the realm of the political and they forget about what real politics is about. Therefore, what realists, realists do um, they, they seek to trace a distinctively political normativity and argue that political theory must treat the political as a sphere which is autonomous from morality. Realists uh, view the political world uh, in a way that they see that there are specific political norms and standards. However, about the nature and ex extent of these standards, political realists disagree. So is it legitimacy or some specific context bound norms of conduct? These questions are connected to the realist idea that politics is not only about struggles for power, but is uh, inherently conflictual and agonistic. Now, I would like to argue that there is an essentially political conception that arises from the struggles for power and that defines specifically the political sphere, and it is exclusion. So in other words, there is an ongoing perpetual possibility of exclusion in several levels of politics, which makes it peculiar. In my view, the political is the sphere which is led by the endless struggle, not only for power, but rather for not to be excluded at various levels of politics. Either uh, we can talk about uh, exclusion from governmental power or party politics, or being deprived from one's voice or participation, but also it can mean a more fundamental type of exclusion, which is the very exclusion from the political community, which might involve other fatal exclusions. So if I'm not uh, regarded as a true or equal member of the political community, it deprives me from other possibilities as well. So there is, in my view, a conceptual advantage uh, in the term exclusion, and it is its passive character. So exclusion uh, does not require any actual claim to appear on the side of the excluded subject. In this understanding, the political is not necessarily intertwined with explicit claims of recognition or actual participation, nor it depends on someone's active uh, will to be heard. Rather, it means both intentional and unintentional exclusion of certain individuals from certain aspects of politics. So why exclusion is specific to the political sphere? It is indeed possible to imagine several not characteristically political forms of exclusion. For example, someone might be excluded from a private club a sports club, a circle of friends, or even family. However, in my view, there are three reasons uh, that make exclusion, even in, in the forms of private exclusions, inherently political. So first, exclusion is definitive. It hinders any further possibilities for the excluded to get back into the game, or even be included in the first place. It enables those who exclude to not to play by the rules when it comes to the excluded. It can be fatal for the excluded 
because it deprives them of the basic prerequisites needed to formulate claims of recognition, voice, or participation. Second, exclusion is propulsive. It's a primary driving force for the political sphere. Be it a struggle for governmental power, a fight in party politics, or an interest group, or a movement, um, politics always produces its excluded, even in its very basic forms, such as the political community. Moreover, those who exclude often benefit from the very fact of the dispossession of liberty, equality, recognition, voice, economic security, or certain statuses of the excluded. So political communities are dependent on that exclusion. And third, exclusion is structural. Exclusions that may seem private at the first sight, such as exclusion from a sports club, a circle of friends or family, unfold very often from deeper structural exclusions. For example, even I am offered reasons for being excluded from the university football team for being too weak or too slow. The genuine reason for my exclusion may be attached to me being a woman and therefore regarded unfit for playing football. So it is similar to the case of friends and family where gender, race, sexual orientation, and other social characteristics can be underlying reasons for excluding someone, even from the circle of the most loved ones. So exclusion is characteristically political. However, this idea is far from new because it is, it is long realized by several theories from different streams of thought Exclusion has always been a key concept for feminist theory, which is not a coincidence. Uh, feminist theories are often motivated by the resentment about the exclusion of women from several areas of the political. Nancy Hirschman, for example, recently uh, is famous for criticizing exclusionary practices that deprive the importance of women's exp experience both in practice and theory. Elizabeth Fraser also recognized that the notion of intersectionality may lead to additive double or triple exclusions from the political sphere. Um, taking this situation of women throughout history as an example, we can see that their exclusion had been definitive in the sense that women's exclusion hindered any further claims of women to be effectively included in the political community. It is propulsive in the sense that other social groups, for example, white males, often benefited, benefited from the exclusion of women from politics. And it is structural in the sense that women have been excluded from the public by institutionalized practices of exclusion. And uh, similar considerations about exclusion can be found in the works of uh, Republican, uh, contemporary Republican political theory, uh, or in the works of Hannah Arendt, uh, and in Judith Schklar's idea of liberalism of fear, uh, where she claims that the war, racism, sexism, and systemic go governmental brutality are real dangers in all types of uh, regimes. So the deep permanence of exclusion in politics is a long recognized element of our social and political lives. Now it's time to add my last step to my argument. Now we can see that exclusion is unavoidable in politics. So it is, it is a part of politics, but it is still a too broad term. My idea is that it could be narrowed down and the exclusion in movement should be addressed. Although movement is often regarded as a problem or an ex exception from the normality of the operation of the word, uh, in reality, it has been always part of human life. 
and it is intertwined with the permanent possibility of exclusion. So the best way of picturing this is to use Thomas Nea's idea of the figure of the migrant. He claims that the theme of this figure runs along with human history and carries an element of exclusion. So Nea's view of exclusion in migration and movement corresponds to the three conditions which, in my view, make exclusion special. So it's, it is definitive because Neil claims even the end result of migration and movement is a relative increase in money, power, or something else. The process of movement itself almost always involves some kind of insecurities. It is also propulsive because it serves as a driving force for political communities. If we see the metics of Athens or the barbarians of Rome, they played a huge part in maintaining the well-being of the citizens of these empires. In medieval Europe, serfdom has been the key, key organizing principle of feudalism. And in capitalism, the proletariat have been generating social benefits and economic and political benefits for the ruling class. Now, migrant workers, especially female care workers, uh, also share that role. So finally, and we can say that uh, um, this exclusion in movement is structural because it applies to individuals precisely because their membership in some groups. So as women uh, or migrants or, or migrant women. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much for such a great presentation and uh, being on timely. So uh, we have finished all of the presentations. So now we will have a question answer session. Uh, I can see that uh, dear Fai Hassan has a question. So uh, Fai, please go ahead and ask your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, my question is for Sabrina White. Uh, from University of Leeds. Uh, the question may or may not help directly to your research, but you highlighted a very important aspect uh, that is nation branding as statecraft. I would like your response to us two important points. Uh, who are their targets? You, I mean, when uh, a state employs nation branding as statecraft, who are they aimed to influence? Is it their own public or it is international public. Second, the availability of other fast-paced mediums, such as RT, independent whistleblowers, you know, it is globalized world. So how it will cope with these challenges, the nation branding as to cross? I would like your response, please. Thank you very much for your question, uh, or for your questions. Yeah, so who are their targets, uh, their own public or international? Um, both, right? You know, nation branding was is was originally envisaged as something to project an image of the state before the rest of the world. You know, in France's case, it was originally to attract investment, um, but also to kind of try to maintain its legitimacy in its position on the UN Security Council, right? That the world of 1945 is, is quite vastly different for France to the world today. Um, and so it's sort of trying to, you know, legitimize its status on the council. Um, but France is particularly unique in, you know, its its international politics um, are always incredibly sensitive to to you know public opinion to the sort of the liminal state, and so nation branding would say is something that is quite liminal, uh, and so it's unique in this way of how states are, you know, their foreign policies uh, and domestic policies, but also domestic public opinion. That nation branding is sort of one expression of one of the different ways that we could look at that. Um, and your question on globalization. I mean, nation branding is essentially a response to globalization, right? It's a, a competitive brand management. It's a, an economic um, um, sort of activity uh, alongside the, the political side of it. And so, you know, Georgina, and I think at least is something quite interesting to look at uh, in terms of, you know, how states are adopting particular agendas, why they're doing it, and actually what's happening domestically and how that sort of influences uh, these new foreign policy agendas. I hope that answers your question. I will ask a follow-up question to Sabrina again. So you said that the uh, French government is running a feminist uh, foreign policy approach, yeah? So what, what, 
beyond the academic research, what's your personal opinion on this policy? So I think that the policy is kind of, it's a little bit messy. So we've actually already submitted this paper. It's under review right now. Um, so one of the things that France has done is draw a lot of attention domestically to uh, sexual harassment um, in France. And then duly, they've really you know, expanded to the narratives on conflict-related sexual violence, right? Um, but then sort of sexual violence is sort of a, a continuum thing is an everyday thing or, or women's equality, but these have been really empty uh, narratives. So for instance, uh, France has yet to release its uh, next national action plan on the women, peace and security agenda. Um, it has this uh, gender strategy for 2018 to 2022, but there's absolutely no funding <laughs> that's attributed to it. Um, and so there are quite a lot of empty things that are happening here. I say one of the things that they are doing that is, is quite optimistic though, in, in all fairness to them, um, is trying to promote workplace equality. So they've been handing out grants um, to a number of European countries, particularly Eastern European countries, Balkans, um, to try to, to combat discrimination in the workplace. Um, but beyond that, not much, <laughs> basically. Thank you very much. Anyone has any question? Please raise your hand. All of our participants are here to answer. Okay. Yes, please go ahead, Sabrina. Okay, I just wanted to ask a, a question to um, Mohammed. Um, that uh, I, I wonder, have you looked at Turkey's national action plan for women, peace, and security? And then, secondly, a suggestion that all of the, the dimensions that you were speaking about. So, um, I wonder sorry, if you. I think Mohammed is not here with us right now. Oh, I'll email him. Don't worry. Okay, okay. thanks. Sorry. You're yeah, welcome. So, Dr. Rahman, yes, please. Hi, I have three questions, one of them for the Yasemin and the other one for the Sabrina and the last one is going to be for Anna Ujlaki. Uh, I am going to start with the, uh, my first question to Yasemin Chelikov. So uh, the magnificent the serial in Turkey and then you mentioned that it is actually attracting the women's attention uh, in Russia. But from the uh, internal discussion about the uh, magnificent Suleiman and uh, in Turkey, there were really hard criticism about the private life of sultans uh, in the movies. So uh, it has been claimed that the, uh, a, a sultan or Turkish or Ottoman sultan has lots of women in the private chamber. Uh, and so it is not uh, compatible with the modern ideas. So uh, actually the main idea is the normal, normalizing the, this kind of historical ancient understanding uh, via the, uh, through the, this series in Ottoman history. So what would you say? Don't you think that it's contradiction between the domestic understanding of uh, these series and the women's uh, I, I am really shocked when you say that the uh, uh, women in Russia actually uh, really uh, fan of this uh, series. So uh, what do you think about that? My question is going to be that. And uh, my second question for the uh, Sabrina, uh, uh, when you start your uh, presentation about the abuses by the French soldiers, in Central African uh, country, uh, just the uh, power relation, con concept of power relation pops up in my mind. And I said, okay, so if French uh, soldier could do that and they try to clear up via the, uh, what, what was your argument? Uh, legitimizing uh, or changing the subject in that aspect. Okay, so, uh, do you think that the French people, because they have the colonial history in Africa, and I remember that the last week Macron apologized for uh, one of the group in Africa. I don't remember in which country, but uh, sometimes they do that. So uh, really people in Central Africa or other African countries uh, believe that, okay, French 
uh, is really why not the abuse is our mature or our conflict or they said okay uh, france is actually our savior from the uh, ancient and barbaric nature and the, the french uh, people they made us model so uh, do you have any uh, information about the domestic perception of these abuses in central africa uh, and my last question about is for uh, would you like him? Uh, sorry for the wrong pronunciation uh, one of the example you gave actually you reminds me that the conflict between the naturality and exclusion so if somebody is excluded from a, a football team because he is weak so you included that uh, case into the exclusion theory so uh, how because there is something natural because the football is really uh, how can we say it's a hard play so you need to be really strong enough to get interaction it's sometimes really getting really uh, uh, hard so what what do you think that naturality between the relation between naturality and uh, exclusion so i am not so handsome and if i am not be chosen as the most handsome world in in global level so do you think that i am still do you think that i can feel that i am excluded because naturally i am not that much handsome so that i should be uh, i shouldn't be feel that okay i'm excluded they don't consider me the one of the handsome or the most handsome in the world so naturality and the exclusion what do you think the relation between these two concepts and thank you very much Um, I guess I can start um, since you started with my question, Rahman. Um, so just to kind of summarize what you asked, um, you said that domestically. So in Turkey, there was opposition to a Turkish TV series, uh, Magnificent Century, because of how Sultan Suleiman was represented in the series um, as, you know, a sultan who was just preoccupied with his harem and his many women. Um, and actually, uh, there was a lot of opposition to this TV series, indeed, um, so much so that it was banned, it was taken down from Turkish um, Airlines um, viewing. <laughs> um, at the same time, there wasn't that much opposition to preclude it from being exported widely across the globe uh, to more than 100 countries. Um, so as far as so. I mean, here we kind of see the um, the kind of the paradox between okay, we are our histories being misrepresented, and and the paradox, of course, being by the the ruling government uh, AKP. So yes, our history is being misrepresented, but uh, the money that it brings in is really good. So we'll just keep it going, right? That's what we saw with Magnificent Century, um, but. Like, how could Russian women be so attracted to the series, right? Um, and maybe even um, as, um, uh, uh, what was her, uh, Alexia Bloch, she wrote a book called Sex, Love and Migration. Um, and it was about romantic entanglements between Russian migrant women and Turkish men. Um, and she actually wrote in it that Magnificent Century, like Russian women mentioned that in her ethnographic study as kind of like this idealized version of like romance between Russian women and Turkish men. And of course, uh, Roxelana or Hiram, so the Sultan's favorite in this case, who actually became um, his wife, uh, is Ukrainian. But that's kind of like overlooked because, you know, she speaks Russian and she, she very much acts as Russian. But um, basically, the women uh, in this, so there's also like this really um, predominant view still of Turkey, right? As like th that comes from 1001 night story. So like the exotic, the East, the, I don't know, the, the romantic, the emotional, the warm, the hot, the Turkish men. So <laughs> it's all kind of in tandem. And of course, when they watch a Turkish TV series, they're not thinking of the Sultan's harem or, or this particular series. They're just focusing on the relationship between the Sultan and his favorite wife who 
speaks Russian, who is of like uh, at least linguistic Russian origin. Um, but the thing is, that wasn't the only TV series that was really popular, right? So that really spearheaded the vast distribution. Um, and I would like to argue, and I argue elsewhere, that um, this is really due to the terrible conditions of women in Russia and um, as far as domestic violence and, and also um, and, and, and the murder of women, um, most of whom are committed by intimate romantic partners. Um, so there is, Russia actually has a dem demography problem. Women are leaving en masse um, and there are quite a few productions that answer, that respond to this leaving of women um, of, of Russia to go elsewhere and Turkey being one of the, the prime um, uh, locales for women to relocate and find, um, you know, husbands and partners. Um, Oriental Wives is one such production. There's another one, Married to Foreigners. So these are like docudramas where they interview Russian women. And of course, they don't highlight, uh, they interview Russian women who are married to, like for Oriental Wives, it's actually, it actually says it's advertised as their, the screen behind this or the truth behind a spectacular screen of Turkish TV series. So it poses- it's presented, please. Can you give short, short answers because we don't have, we just have one minute left. Actually, we're over time, right? Yes, we are over <laughs> we're time. We're about 13 minutes over time. But Rahman asked for it, so I'm, I'm delivering. <laughs> <laughs> I have been permitted to ask, so, okay. That's okay. up to moderate so, it inside, so but. Let me really wrap it up. So Putin's alignment with the Orthodox Church um, kind of propagates this like fear and anxiety that Russian women, so a pure Russian race is, uh, you know, Russian women leaving Russia is a big threat to Russia. So um, one way they do this is by trying to fight the Turkish TV series through their own Russian Orientalist productions. Um, and the end. Thank you. So I don't think we have enough time for other questions. In one minute, uh, so you can maybe one or a couple of words. Okay, it's okay. up to you. So from from Anna or Sabrina, which question do you want? Okay, you you can email each other. So you have uh, probably you can find it on website as well. So you can ask your question. They they will answer your question because the next panel will start in just uh, a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds later. So thank you very much for all participating in this uh, uh, conference, this panel uh, this morning. Uh, and thank you for organizing com committee for letting us be a part of this uh, conference. Uh, the next panel will start soon and the moderator will be Professor Anna Monica because uh, Bazan Balam Mizdushkin is not available today. And so she is not going to be with us. So I will uh, leave the stage to Professor Anna Monica. Thank you very much again, and uh, have a nice and lovely day. <laughs>